Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, the bitch you channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I'd appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place where you, on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box below. Lately, my social media has exploded with what I can only call politics baiting. That is, various political factions have been posting anything that they think bolsters their opinion with the specific intent of angering anyone with a differing opinion. It's become so bad that almost everything on my Twitter and Facebook feeds are just about politics, and I find myself constantly scrolling in order to find anything that's not politics related. It's become an incredible amount of chaff that makes it impossible for me to find anything that's truly interesting. And worse, this politics, debating, politics baiting has devolved into complete insanity. I'm now seeing all manner of idiocy, from white robots being racist to numerological Nazi signaling based on when flags are raised from half to full staff. Everyone on either side has gone completely insane. Now, I've scratched my head about this to try to come up with what might be causing it, and I think I've got three major factors that seem to be fueling, fueling the insanity. The first is our nihilistic culture. Then there's the press, and last but not least, social media. Now, this is all exhibited by something I like to call the Babelfish Syndrome. And to understand what I mean by this, it refers to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, radio and TV series and novels and movie written by the late, great Douglas Adams. And while these are all largely satire, like all good satire, there are nuggets of truth. One of Adams' more amusingly seeming inventions is a life form called the Babelfish. And here is what the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has to say on the subject of the Babelfish. The Babelfish is small, yellow, leech-like, and probably the oddest thing in the universe. It feeds on brainwave energy absorbed from unconscious mental frequencies and then excretes into the mind of its carrier a telepathic matrix formed by the nerve signals picked up from the speech centers of the brain. The practical upshot of which is that if you stick one in your ear, you can instantly understand anything said to you in any form of language. Now, it is such a bizarrely improbable coincidence that something, something so mind-bogglingly useful could have evolved purely by chance that some thinkers have chosen to see it as the final and clinching proof of the non-existence of God. The argument goes something like this. I refuse to prove that I exist, says God, for proof denies faith, and without faith I am nothing. But, says man, the Babelfish is a dead giveaway, isn't it? It proves you exist, and so therefore you don't. QED. Oh dear, says God, I hadn't thought of that, and promptly vanishes in a puff of logic. Oh, that was easy, says man, and for an encore he goes on to prove that black is white and gets killed in the next zebra crossing. Most leading theologians claim that this argument is a load of fetid dingo's kidneys, but that didn't stop Ulan Kalufid from, using it, from making a small fortune by using it as a central theme of his best-selling book. Well, that about wraps it up for God. Meanwhile, the poor Babelfish, by effectively removing all barriers to communication between different cultures and races, has caused more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation. That last part about removing all barriers to communication between different races and cultures causing more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation is in fact true. The reality is that some ideas and belief systems are totally incompatible with each other. As long as these ideas and belief systems remain relatively isolated, people tend to get along fairly peacefully. However, when we become aware of just how incompatible they are, they tend to be perceived as existential threats. I've spoken about this before, but over the course of my lifetime, our culture has transformed from something that was optimistic to one that is utterly nihilistic. I grew up in the middle of the Cold War, 
And because of where I lived, I was always under constant threat of death by nuclear fire. If the U.S. and Soviet Union ever, had ever gone to World War III, it was an absolute certainty that I would die. Fortunately, that never happened. However, it was always in the minds of my generation, and it drove our political and scientific beliefs to a great degree. When the Cold War ended, we all breathed a collective sigh of relief. We thought that our children would grow up in a much more peaceful and hopeful world than we had. And it turns out that we couldn't have been more wrong. While it's certainly true that the world became a far more peaceful place, and reality it still is, we allowed our culture to descend into a nihilism that neither I nor my parents nor grandparents, who'd also lived through the Cold War and under threat of nuclear death, we couldn't have foreseen this. In prior generations, it was accepted that we would do well for ourselves and leave an even better world for our children. This has, in fact, exactly been what happened, even including modern era. But because my generation's negligence, our, our culture changed. Now, believe it or not, the world was once a hopeful place. We approached the inequities of life as challenges that could be overcome. Our popular culture, our movies, TV, music, etc., it all reflected this. Now, as a lifelong Star Trek fan, I can use this as an example because nowhere is this more evident than in that franchise. The original Star Trek series of the 1960s was intentionally optimistic. During an era when death by nuclear war was ever present, series creator Gene Roddenberry wanted to show a future in which Earth's modern inequities were gone. Women were equal to men. People of all races, some of them alien, worked side by side as equals. Hunger, want, and need had been completely eradicated. When Earth's past was explicitly mentioned, we were explicitly told that everything we feared had been overcome. Star Trek's universe was a place in which I desperately wanted to live. This hopeful outlook on the future continued through all of that cast's films. Whatever threat they might face, Earth's modern foibles were never among them. The era of Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager, and Star Trek Enterprise all shared this hopeful outlook on the future. In the case of The Next Generation, Gene Roddenberry had an active role in production of the first two seasons, and consequently, he sort of, you know, made, wrote the, wrote the uh, mold on exactly how that should be uh, taken and how it should be handled. By the next generation's third season, health concerns had forced Roddenberry to retire. He was replaced by Rick Berman, who shepherded all the series and movies that came after that. Berman was adamant that Roddenberry's vision of a peaceful future be maintained. However, between the end of Star Trek Enterprise in 2005 and the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies beginning in 2009, our culture had changed. Now, Abrams understood the hopeful nature of the Star Trek universe and remained faithful to it. He certainly produced some really generic action films, but he always portrayed our past as foibles that we had overcome to build a better future. But by Star Trek Discovery in 2017, culture had changed completely. With Roddenberry's death in 1991 and Berman's ending in the franchise stewardship in 2005, Discovery's production team had changed to much younger people. This team had been raised in a culture that was nihilistic and self-destructive. They could no longer imagine or even envision a hopeful future. And so Star Trek Discovery is a dark one filled with all the death and mayhem that a big budget can bring to your screen. Younger fans really enjoy this series. I have questioned them about it sometimes and they routinely say that it's because it's a more realistic look at the future. But when I ask them, why do you enjoy it? They tell me because it's darker. When I ask them, why do you prefer darkness to light? They've got no answer. And how could they? They were raised in a culture in which darkness, death, horror, and destruction are ever-present and imaginary. Their music is filled with horror. Generic as the corporate manufactured bands of the early 2000s might have been. They stand in stark contrast to what is now the norm. Their TV is filled with horror. Shows that should elicit disgust 
due to their graphic nature and mores are celebrated. Their films are also filled with horror. Again, movies that should elicit disgust due to their graphic violence and mores are celebrated. And much of the video games are filled with horror. One look at one of the most popular, the Grand Theft Auto series, tells us the tale. My generation's children and later have grown up in a culture of horror and nihilism. It is all they ever see. It is all they ever expect to see. Showing Star Trek as something hopeful will not work for them because they can no longer imagine a hopeful world of any kind. Small wonder that they can be brainwashed to believe that they will be absolutely dead with inside of 30 years due to one manufactured crisis or another. If you are a younger person watching me, I'd like to give you this message. You really have no idea what a truly horrible future should look like. I lived under the threat, the certain death, by nuclear fire until my children were young. There were several instances in which we became very, very close. You really have little to worry about. You have simply been brainwashed by your educators and culture to believe in things that have no scientific validity. You are living in a hopeful, science fictional world that was my dream as a child, and it's a tragedy that our culture blinds you to it. And then we have probably the largest contributor to this uh, issue of the Babelfish Syndrome, which is social media. Social media has removed all barriers to communication between different races and cultures. And while this sounds noble, it turns out that it's destructive. When I was young, communications was largely word of mouth, spoken among friends or neighbors. Even if you disagreed about something, you had to be civil about it. If you were the kind of jerk that we now routinely see on social media, well, you had to worry about making another person feel bad or worse, getting punched in your face. Today, we rarely interact with anyone face to face except in a work environment. Now, this was really brought home to me a few years ago when there was a storm that caused an extensive power outage that lasted for several hours. Stripped of their computing devices, neighbors were forced to go outside and forced to interact with each other. And I was really struck by it because it was the sort of thing that we used to do as a matter of course. Well, today, we are all isolated with our computers and smartphones, rarely stepping outside except perhaps to do some yard work. We communicate entirely online, and due, the, due to the anonymity of social media, we are not obliged to be civil to one another. In fact, social media's anonymity has completely removed civil discourse from modern society, and it bleeds over into the real life in ways that are both insane and violent. Everything on social media is what we used to call a flame war. It's simply expected that you'll be a complete dren hole at all times. And this was really brought home to me recently when Anna, who's also known as that Star Wars girl on YouTube, experienced an unspeakable family tragedy. Her sister was reported missing, and a week later, Anna reported that her sister had passed away. While Anna has never given specific details, under the circumstances, it's probably safe to assume the very worst. While the outpouring of sympathy was overwhelming, there were still critics of Anna's who could find the time to wish her sister's death and to call Anna vulgar names. This is a woman who talks about Star Wars. What kind of sick monster do you have to be to dislike what someone who talks about Star Wars so much as to wish her sister dead? That is just how far anonymity has taken us. You don't even have to hold your tongue for a Star Wars fangirl whose sister has died under what can only be some of the worst circumstances imaginable. And worse. The companies who provide platforms for social media are biased with an obvious leftist bent. If you can't see the bias, then chances are you're a leftist yourself. The big tech companies operate in a isolated bubble of communist and socialist thought. They honestly believe themselves to be unbiased because all the people around them share their views. And you can't convince them otherwise. It's like trying to explain the color blue to a blind man. This is all way exacerbated by a multitude of 24-hour press outlets, whether they be television or internet-based. Always remember the secondary motto of my show, which scrolls past the lower third of every single episode. Nothing you see in the press is real. 
nothing. Now, I've made a 30-year hobby of debunking the press. I've done it twice on this show in episodes entitled Viewer Challenge, Debunk the Press, and Nothing You See in the Press is Real. Nothing. And there are links to those in my description box. And it's certainly time to do another example of debunking as soon as something else isn't happening. I'll do so. But debunking is kind of an evergreen topic I can do at any time when there's a slow news week, but unfortunately, that hasn't happened lately. But given any press report from any news outlet, whether it's ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, The New York Times, or your local newspaper, such as my own Lincoln Journal Star, I can prove one of three things. Either that the event being reported never happened, that the event didn't happen as reported, or that when stripped of, of opinion, emotionally loaded language, and filler, the facts devolve to a couple of paragraphs or even just a few sentences. Nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. It never has been real, and it never will be real. The modern press are the intellectual heirs of William Randolph Hearst. If you don't know, he was one of the first media magnates of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He owned an enormous number of newspapers nationwide at a time when all news was from newspapers. He was, in whole or in part, responsible for the Spanish-American War, using mistruths, half-truths, or outright lies to inflame the American public. Always remember, the job of a reporter isn't to report the facts. It's to sell advertising. They will do anything, including making things up out of whole cloth, in order to make the news more exciting and thereby sell more advertising. And, as with social media, the press is biased with an obvious leftist bent. If you can't see the bias, then chances are you're a leftist yourself. The press operates in an isolated bubble of thought of communism and socialism. They honestly believe themselves to be unbiased because all the people around them share their ideas. And again, you cannot convince them otherwise. It's like trying to explain the color blue to a blind man. Now, this is dangerous because there are ideas and belief systems that are completely incompatible. Mixing them can only lead to violence. By removing all barriers to communications via a nihilistic culture, social media, and a 24-hour press, we are now all exposed to ideas and belief systems that are diametrically opposed to our own, and often, in fact, to reality. There can be no middle ground in these instances. There can only be hatred. Now. It would be nice to think that people would support the idea that I disagree with what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Sadly, it doesn't work out that way. The sentiment is, I disagree with what you have to say, and if I can't change your mind peacefully, I'll kill you. And that's where we are today, warring ideas and belief systems that cannot possibly be reconciled. The agitators of a nihilistic culture, social media, and the press only serve to deepen the divide and cause hatred on every side. It is no longer possible to be civil to one another. And given how the simply insane things that almost everyone is now peddling and propagating on social media, this is in fact a perfect recipe for civil war. Now what can we do about this? Well, there are a number of things that must be done in order to pull that babelfish back out of our ears. We must essentially re-isolate ourselves. You must reject the nihilistic culture. You must turn off violent and or disgusting TV or internet streams. You must no longer buy music with no redeeming value other than to glorify violence and horror. You must stop seeing films that include horror, graphic violence, and other disgusting mores. You must further cancel all subscriptions to all newspapers. You must turn off all news channels. You must click away from all internet news sources. And you absolutely must stop sharing any news from any source on social media. It is all complete and utter nonsense. Nothing you see in the press is real. Nothing. You must refrain from using social media for any purpose other than keeping in contact with friends and family. 
when interacting on social media, you must remember that there is a human being on the other side of that screen. Treat them with the simple respect and courtesy of the kind that your mother tried to drill into you for 18 years. Don't curse and swear at them. Just be nice people. And if you can't do that, then I guarantee civil war in the very near future. And that is all that I have to say about that. I'd love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to them. So, thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, the BitChute channel where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.